It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Aurelia Byrne, RDA, CDA, COA, the CDA Certified Dental Assistant, COA Certified Orthodontic Assistant, and she's a registered dental hygienist and the founder of AFLEX Assist Arm, which is the first company in dentistry that invented a third arm that attaches to the back of a dental chair, giving hundreds of practicing dental hygienists and dentists an extra hand. AFLEX provides quality products that offer solutions to current problems in dentistry, such as aerosol management and dental economics. And I, um, I saw, I uh, posted your story on Dental Town. Um, this guy started a, a thread. My assistant's arm uh, won't turn. And you know the I love entrepreneurs. I love operations and logistics and I love this whole story and I asked you to come on the show. Um, thanks you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored. Like I was, when I, when you asked me or I was like, Oh my gosh, this is a great, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Oh, thanks, man. Sorry, it's the day after election and you live in Florida. You, 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 you'd probably be happy to be anywhere uh, than that. Uh, 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 it's funny because uh, I live in Arizona and now they uh, jokingly call us the Florida of the West. Oh, so, uh, so we both should be equally insane for this uh, podcast interview. Um, how? Um, first of all, your journey. Um, my gosh, you were some certified dental assistant, certified orthodontic assistant. Um, you became a hygienist. Um, you have um, um, DNA that's dental. Are you, are you related um, to that other um, Kirk? Is he uh, family or, or? He is. He's my uncle. He, he, uh, uh, my aunt is the blood relation. She married uh, him. She was his dental assistant and, and in his practice many, many years ago, back, uh, gosh, I wouldn't say late, late eighties. And so from there, um, I, he trained me on the job when, you know, I said, Hey, I want to, I want to, while I was in college doing something completely different, I was going for environmental engineering at that time. I was like, I'll work at your dental office, you know, for, for a short period of time and make some extra cash. And next thing I know, it like turned into this whole entire career unexpectedly. Um, so it's, it was interesting because I, I wasn't expecting that. But So were you born out there in California, San Juan Capistrano? I actually was born in Arizona. Oh, really? Where, whereabouts? I am, um, was born in Tucson, Arizona. Wow, that is wild. Uh, you've lived a lot of places on uh, Tucson, California. I love that San Juan Capistrano course. Um, uh, we, that was one of the first vacations um, our family took. All, uh, we all wanted to see Disneyland, but mom wanted to see that uh, Capistrano. That, that is really a beautiful place there. Uh, and so then you, um, so you played around there and started assisting there. Where did you go to hygiene school? Um, I went to hygiene school in Dallas, Texas at uh, Concord Career College in Dallas. So it was a, you know, an accelerated program, very, very strict on ergonomics. And they, they did a great job. I was really impressed. And because I was in the education industry as a dental assistant instructor for a proprietary school like that, I understood how it was going to operate and how, how fast it was going to move us through and how important it was to, 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 you know, do exactly what they told us to do. So and they got no they got three locations. They got one out there. They're they're in uh, Kansas City. They're yeah. in Jacksonville, Florida, and Dallas, Texas. So are they? Are you close to? Uh, uh, well, you're in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. How close is that to uh, Jacksonville? That's not very close, is it? Uh, yeah, that's Jacksonville's like three to four hours, maybe five hours north. Yeah, five, five hours. hours. Well, I, yeah. I got to tell you the dumbest uh, thing. Uh, when I realized I did not know my geography, I'll never, this is the most stupid story known to man. I was uh, lecturing in Houston. It was the first time. And I got in there early and I thought, well, you know what would be fun? Since you're right there on the border, I'm just going to go spend, uh, when I get there, I'm going to go right to the border. So I throw all my luggage on the bed and I run down and I hail a cab. And I said, and he jumps in and goes, where are you going? I said, the border, Mexico. And he looks at me and goes, Mexico? I go, yeah, Me Mexico. I want to go to the border. He goes, dude, we're eight hours from Mexico. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, Houston. It's right there in the bottom right-hand corner. And, you know, you don't have, you know, that's before smartphones and computers. He showed me a map, and I'm like, I can't freaking believe it. In my walnut brain, I just thought, you know, you have Dallas. Houston's down there by Mexico. Uh, but uh, cra crazy, crazy. Um, so um, you um, are now in um, um, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, yeah. So do you think you'll go back to that um, um, that hygiene school uh, in um, up the street? 
uh, to, oh, in five, five hours from here, Jacksonville. Yeah. I mean, are, are, are you still, are you, are you, well, some people, when they, uh, they, they just have this burning uh, desire to teach. Like I got friends out here that just crush it Monday through Thursday and then take a bath, but they, they work one day a week in one of these two dental schools and they, and they love that the most. And they get, they earn, you know, like a little hundred dollars or two hundred dollars a day so some some people just will will teach money for free they love teaching so much i i i would definitely love to teach uh unfortunately i don't have my license here in florida so when i when i moved here which was just in march recently you know all my my license is in actually in texas and in arizona so to get a license over here i have to go like i have to go through all these different boards it's unbelievable like they should well, make let, it well, a standardized thing ridiculous well let, let's let's talk about that because arizona is the first state that passed a law that we accept licenses from any of the other 50 states and doesn't matter if it's accounting cpa whatever but those are economic barriers to free trade i mean i i i think it's so comical how you know our government will spend like six years writing a free trade agreement i mean if it was free trade just say hey aurelia go, go, feel free to trade but yeah. when it takes six years and a thousand attorneys to write a deal, um, they know they're lying, cheating, and stealing. And um, and all these uh, board things was because dental societies, which dentists still contribute PAC money to, go get mm-hmm. lawyers. They pass all these barriers to free trade, and it hurts the patient. And uh, they think they're going to make more money for that, but it ends up hurting them in the long run. But anyway, I just think it's totally old school. Um, Arizona just passed uh, medical marijuana uh, yesterday. Thirteenth uh, state already passed, huh? Well, they nope. had, they had they had medical marijuana, but now it's recreational. Oh, it's recreational now. Yeah, recreational, <laughs> and uh, it, it's it's such because now that it, first it was medical, so it's all you know. The mob's just going to shake you down for all this money and the license and the dispensary. I mean, I just cannot believe that even after this election that people still think that whoever they voted for is going to be there to help them. I mean, the, the mob's only been trying to shake you down and steal all your money, your whole flipping life. And, um, I, uh, it'll be the uh, 13th, uh, for recreation. You're like, okay, so you can buy it at Walgreens. Oh no, no, it'll be like a liquor license, a marijuana license. I mean, they're going to get all their fingers in there and just ruin it every way they can. I, I still think it's embarrassing that you go down to, uh, San Diego. Why do Americans not figure out that, a five dollar uh, deal of beer in the United States cross the border, and it's a dollar. And it's a it's a friendly government always there trying to help them. I thought yesterday was like deciding whether you want it, you, your leg amputated above or below the knee. I mean, uh, the, you know, the two choices we always get. Um, another thing I want to ask you from marketing, you call it the A Flex X assist arm, mm-hmm. um, but that little um, that little thing that little curly cue in yeah. the deal um, does that um, does that affect your seo your website is that or is that less like a letter in the alphabet i was wondering how that af- affected marketing branding in a world that's gone digital what, what yeah. is that thing even called good 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 call um we just actually learned about that in our seo and on our because it's an actual coding thing and sometimes you can't put that in um in certain things so we literally just learned that probably about four months ago but honestly when when we came up with it, it was just a cool, it was supposed to be cool looking. And it's A flex. I know a lot of you go A flex X, which it looks like, you know, because the X is bigger, but that's just Well, I, I have five programmers that, that run Dental Town right. Yeah. And uh they would they all saw that and had a heart attack. Just like, okay, she's a hygienist. You gotta tell her, no, you can't do that. That's uh uh that's uh yeah. I have to I, make uh, it just a line or something, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, it's just, uh, my God, everything is SEO. And the thing that's really bizarre about dentists is what they don't realize is um, one of the things that kills their SEO, like they're thinking, well, should I buy more Facebook ads or should I do this or that? And it's the little things. It's like, well, you're on your website. It says 101 uh, First Street. And then you spell out first, F-I-R-S-T. And then on your other thing, it's the numeral one with an S-T. And you and I can look at that and both know it's it's first. But a computer isn't a brain. It, 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 you know, it, it just gets there and it doesn't know what to do. And it is amazing how um, if you just make all your 
uh, you know, your Google listing, your website list, if everything just has the exact same cut and paste, address, zip code, everything the same, then the brainless artificial intelligence SEO can, can figure it all out together. But that one is going to just, that is going to be crazy. That's the, uh, yeah, you just got to. That, that, yes, that's my own. we were told that and so <laughs> we have to yeah it's so funny but we just learned that and we've been around like since 2016 with that little in yay thing you know that little squiggly the so. little squiggly yeah and if you're listening to this when you get to work i mean just go to your website and google your name go to your facebook page go to all your social media and just ask yourself is every single detail exactly the same because remember if i ask you if I asked you to go make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you just grabbed you a piece of bread and you, you'd be talking to me, looking at me the whole time you were making it, right? But a computer yep. can't do that. They're just going to say, well, okay, there's two slices of bread. Slice one, side A, slice one, side B. What, do you want the peanut butter on? Slice, you know, I mean, it, if, you, if you just don't even tell them which side of the bread to put on, the computer will stop and freeze. I mean, it can't think. It just, uh, it has to have everything spelled out perfectly. So tell me about your journey on this A-Flex arm because I thought to myself, well, what was her problem? Was she uh, didn't have an assistant? Uh, you know, why why did she need a third arm? Yeah, good question. Um, it didn't, I mean, honestly, I, again, I started off in dentistry when I was way younger, I was 18. And I just didn't think about, because I was always a dental assistant. It wasn't until I went back to hygiene school that I I realized that the saliva ejectors dripping off the side of the cheek, water spilling up. I got to be in this proper ergonomic position, or else I'm going to get repetitive motion disorders when I, you know, and and muscle soreness. And it was just completely uncomfortable for me personally to practice the way I was taught by the instructors in my school, like that. And they they hammered the ergonomics into us, like we were graded on that. So if I can't see, then, you know, I have to tilt my head. So I thought I just need something right here to hold this, this saliva ejector in place so that, you know, I can see, use my indirect vision and actually see what I'm doing. So fast forward, going through school, graduated 2016. Um, I, I, I met an, an amazing business partner on a, a random trip to Cabo San Lucas, who I didn't know at the time was going to be my business partner. Um, I told him my idea of how I needed this thing and um, took him to the dental office because he's no dental experience, showed him what I was talking about. And a month later, I got the first prototype A-Flex assist arm that holds a saliva ejector. Um, right there. And I was ready. I was like, this is going to market right now. And he's like, whoa, whoa, slow your roll. You're going to have to test this thing. You're going to have to do, you know, all kinds of things. I was like, no, it works. But luckily he pushed me to test more and make more prototypes. So, um, yeah, I, and I love Cabo. I think me and, uh, Craig Steichen, uh, I think we got down there. Uh, he's a dentist advocate gone there like four times to, uh, deep sea fish. Just love that place. Um, Uh, but I, just a heads up to the young kids when you go and it's very interesting um, when you go down there and you see a dentist that looks and talks and has the same accent you do. You got to ask you, did he really want to leave, you know, San Diego and Dallas and um, to go to Cabo and live the rest of his life? No, they're all running from the law and it's always the same thing. They got busted for um, um, insurance um, because and uh, no and, practice. Well, well, the insurance thing is is deal where, you know, I've seen this several times where um, one of their receptionists is is billing incorrectly and it adds up to, you know, hundreds of thousands over the years. And and you tell them, oh, we didn't know. Well, they're not there to help you. Correct. Yeah, they're not. You know, they they can't even um, when you accept Medicaid, they can't even direct deposit in your bank account so that they don't have any effort on their end. But when there's mistakes made. The only thing they want to do to get their brownie point is to convict you and sentence you to jail for seven years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a the, the culture of uh, the law enforcement, the DEA, the police, it, it, it's a sick system. And I, I, I know several dentists. In fact, one of my um, first dentist friends down there um, just died, um, I think, last Thanksgiving at like 80. But he had to live from 60 to 80 in Mexico City because his adorable perfect wife barb who i just loved her to death was a dingbat she didn't know shit about 
billing, and and she screwed it all up, and it took them ten years before Medicaid got on. But at that time, the the, the best deal they'd give them is seven years in prison. Oh wow! So he went, he went he went to yeah. Mexico, and then the and then the other one is um um uh, opioids. You know, they they get addicted to Vicodin or Percodan or whatever, and they're gonna go uh um you know they're gonna have to go do jail time or something, and they go down there, and um so uh. Um, when you meet Dennis down there, you ought to listen to why are you down there and you'll start realizing the other face to your government that you might not always hear about, but it's not pretty. So you're, you're at, um, you're down at Cabo, uh, you're drinking way too much. You tell this guy your story and he makes a prototype. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and, 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 so- when, and how long ago was that? That was for 2016. That was August. It was in August, 2016. Literally we were down there um, for actually my best friend's husband had passed away from cancer very suddenly at a very young age of 32 and her son, you know, it was, a, it, her son took us to Cabo to, to, to get her mind off of this horrific thing that had just happened. And, uh, and Gary, that's my business partner. He was there with his friends celebrating a birthday party, and it got wild. <laughs> nice. And and how was that? And the, another thing of the talk about. I, I know girls aren't going to give away their age or how long they've been out of school or whatever. But a quarter of our listeners are still in dental and kindergarten school. And I know when you're 23, you're going to live forever. You're never going to wreck a motorcycle. You're not going to. You know, you know, nothing goes wrong when you're at that age, but my gosh, you blink. I mean, I can't believe my four boys have turned into six grandkids and now I have a teenager grandkid. Donnell's a teenager. He's 13. I'm like, Donnell, you can't be 13. And uh, my gosh, and, and those long chronic working with your head over direct access, you yeah. don't get it kids i mean it, it's it's you can't do it because it, it's a bad habit i mean it you you uh, and i i had a really bad one i just love to look straight in the mouth i love to bend my head over you know here i got this 10 pound bold bowling ball leaning over looking direct and yeah. um you do that for 10 20 years you're 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 screwed aren't you and then you just say, oh, one more time. Well, oh, I'm not going to do that. And then the next thing you know, you find yourself looking, you know, again. And it is super hard to be in that position. And dentists have it the worst in, in a lot of ways because you got, you know, just so much going on. You know, you got very sharp things. Well, so do hygienists. But, I mean, we can have, we could take our time. We could do, you know, your situation is very, very different in a lot of ways. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember the transition where, you know, when I was in high school, it was, they were still 50-50 stand up, sit down. No, I'd yeah. say that was more in grammar school. And then by high school, I remember uh, the one, the dentist on the west side used to always tease Dr. Uh, Prepard because, uh, uh, no, it was Peltzer. Uh, because he kept standing up and Peltzer he told me, and, he, and he, he told me in strongly worded terms, he goes, I know these guys making fun of me. He goes, uh, they've had more problems taking to the chair than stand up. And so, you know, then you go into dentistry. How do you have all the oral surgeons still doing stand up? Yeah. And then all yeah. the periodontists, you know, and they're, they're placing about the same number of implants, but one all sit down, one all stands up. Do you know if anybody uh, who won the ergonomic award between that oral surgeon standing and periodontist sitting down or what were, what would your thoughts be? I think we should find out. I think that's a, I think that would be a super great study to fi- to figure that out. Like what, what, wh- how many, you know, where is their muscle repetitive motion disorders coming from versus the periodontist? I think that would be awesome. What did you but call it? Repetitive yeah, muscle. Good. What you call uh, it? Re- repetitive uh, muscle, like the repetitive muscle disorder or repetitive muscle. Yeah. Disorder. I can, I forgetting it right all of a sudden. Um, no, excuse me. Repetitive motion disorder. Completely huh. yeah, and I had uh, I had the uh, one of the sweetest patients I ever had just died uh, a couple of weeks ago, and way back in the early '80s, he saw me coming out of the room, and I was like popping my neck and doing this and that, and uh, he was an engineer, and he said he said he said um, no, that that's not how you unwind after doing all that. He goes, I get it, and he came back, and uh, Tom Jacoby, who's the editor of Dental Town Magazine since 2000, uh, he was there. And Sam Dominic was there, and he put up, installed a pull-up bar. And he said, you don't even have to do a pull-up. Just when you're done, just 
grab that thing and hang for one minute. And then I've also heard another doctor who was talking about a, a carpal tunnel syndrome. And he says, yeah, because afterwards they're stressed. They go to the break room, they eat Cheez-Its. And he says, if they just got down on the floor and did one push up on the flat hand, you know, but um, it, it's a weird job. And I'm so jealous of all the people who picked a career that they get to work out all day. Yeah, instead of yeah. sitting at a desk. But I, I think we're entering a new twilight zone where more people are going to be sitting at a desk all day uh, than going out there physically moving. And that that's uh, that's going to cost your body, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so, for sure. So, so was that the main to... thing? Was that the main drive on a flex assist arm? Was ergonomics or was it just the fact yeah. that you just need a third, third arm and would have preferred just hiring an octopus with eight if you could have trained one? I Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. Um, I didn't really, I just felt really passionate about this would help somebody. Cause I, I thought, I mean, I, it helped me. And, and if it helped me, why couldn't it help in all the rest of the hygienists? Like that's really where my brains were at. And then I just got really passionate about this, you know, being in, in, in an ergonomic position and, and just, you know, I wanted to develop more products that would allow us to uh, have more, you know, affordable products for hygienists that they can purchase on their own because not all dentists are generous with their, with their money. I mean, it's, a, there's a lot of overhead in dentistry. So um, it became a passion to do some ergonomics. And then uh, we just decided to do a, a lighter hose, um, which is the, the second ergonomic product that we came out with. And that was mainly for dental assistants because at the time there was no products for dental assistants, which they're always using, you know, their HVE and it's very heavy and that's called the infinity hose. So that's where we got um, the second product. So wh which one's in your hand right now? Uh, this is the original um, A-Flex assist arm. By the way, I love the the way you're doing the A-Flex logo without the squiggle on your shirt. Capital A and N. X, okay, and no squiggle. I'm going to have to talk to talk to our, I, our Well, people. I don't see the squiggle on that. It, it's it's squiggleless, isn't it? It's squiggleless. Yes. Yeah, I think that's perfect. I, that's that's, that's that, no squiggle. Yeah. yeah, no no squiggle. That's the uh, the computers. So so which one's in your hand? So this is the LVE holder. So it has um, it holds a saliva ejector, and this is the the new pump style. Um, the original had a, a blue dial that would go onto the chair, and all of these parts are injection molded. Um, and this just literally, um, you know, I got like seven thousand on my chair. This one goes here and you just pump it on there and it grabs onto your chair. The live ejector hose goes in here and you move this in and out the mouth. Of course, it's much easier when the patient's back. So that's the original LVE. That's my baby. And what's LVE stand for? Low volume evacuation. So like the saliva ejector. Low volume. Huh, that is interesting. Yeah. Uh, so the original AV and that's $239. Yes, sir. Two thirty nine, and the the thing is, is I mean, these are, I mean, these are indestructible. I mean, this is that's one of the things that we really care about is making a product that's going to stand the test of time. I mean, I'm, I get so angry about throwaways and and products that we're like, you have to, you know, buy this and buy more consumables, buy more consumables. And coming from a family of dentistry and knowing the business of dentistry and the overhead that it takes to run a dental office, it's always been something like, gosh, this is just money throwing out, getting out the window, like constantly just what else can we buy? I mean, which is great for business and revenue, but that's not really an ideal situation for. But that was your undergraduate degree though, wasn't it? Sustainability or something like that. <laughs> so that's your roots, right? Well, yeah, I've always been into the environment myself, like always, ever since I was young, I've, I've done a lot of fun environmental uh, things. And by the way, a lot of people, um, they don't like to public speak or do podcasts or write articles because they're afraid someone's going to disagree with them or blah, blah, blah. But uh, I always thought that was the greatest thing. I've had a monthly column from 94 to now. Now I've done, uh, you know, 1500 podcasts and I love it because when I'm wrong, um, I, I don't want to be wrong if I'm wrong. And, um, there was a dentist, Jason Lutchefield, that had me. I was ranting on the environmentalists this this twenty years ago. Yeah, and he just didn't say a word, and he just sent me, mailed me a book, and uh, and uh, my gosh, I got this book, and I laughed. I get, I said, ah, some environmental hippies trying to, you know, uh, convert me. 
read that book, smartest book, best arguments, whatever. One book converted me. Um, it was sustainability. And where they got me is when I, I, what I, what I was not realizing it was it was cheaper. I mean, if you build a house and it's all t- um, rock stone floor, well, uh-huh. it'll be there a thousand years from now. But if you put carpet in there, you got to switch it every five years. Um, you put a, a drop ceiling in there. And then all the water and the drain, it looks like crap, and you're always redoing it. Now you go in there, and they've got rid of the drop ceilings, and they just spray the ceiling. What I like the most is Chipotle. You go into Chipotle, you, you, you could have an NFL football game in there, and nothing would break. I mean, it is designed for elephants to use, and yes. that is a lot more profitable, and it's really good for the environment. Uh, so if you could just get everything to last twice as long, um, you know, it'd be half as much, but um, that uh, that sustainability stuff. Um, but the, so your first one was an A Flex uh, assist arm, the original LVE low volume evacuator. And how are those cells going? Those are good. You know, since we had the HVE, um, the HVE one come out, which I guess we'll discuss a little bit. Uh, we've had way more sales on this because I don't think um, originally since 2016, I mean, we just didn't do any marketing. Everything was organically grown, um, through Facebook and, um, you know, and I was fortunate enough to at least ride that small growth, slow, very slow growth until COVID. And then this thing took off and put us into a whole different level. And, and I'm super grateful. So, so let's talk about that. How did COVID affect you, let alone, um, a high volume and low volume uh, evacuator. Yeah, How does that great work? question. Um, so let me grab this. this. This is so. Remember how I told you there was we had um, a, a light hose for the dental the dental assistant. This is our infinity hose. It's extremely light, extremely flexible, um, and this was something for ergonomics. And this is really what I wanted to push. So when COVID hit, we already had the hose. We just never marketed it. um, And we just, because we were, you know, COVID hit, we were on that trajectory, but it didn't happen. And people were emailing me and and, and Facebooking me saying, when are you going to buy, you know, make an HVE arm? And I thought, well, I understand why people want an HVE arm, um, but it didn't dawn on me till for a long time because we actually had, do you see this little clip here? Yeah. an injection molded clip that we actually made in 2016, knowing that people were eventually going to have to go to an HVE system, not an extra oral system, but an HVE system because of aerosol. We're forgetting the aerosol was a buzz before COVID. Okay. So we knew that we were going to make something for the HVE. Well, we also knew that when we tried to, to make something for the HVE, a long time ago, all the hoses that we we sampled and the valves that they had, they were not holding the the arm was not supporting the, those hoses, and there was thousands and thousands of different valves out there. And you know, valves are these things that go off and on, just in case people don't really know. Um, and then there's metal ones, there's square ones, there's all sorts of them. So we thought, you know, drawing. Let's go back to the drawing board. We can't figure out how to make an arm that's going to support everyone's HVE hose and valve. Then COVID hit and everyone was reaching out. And I said, you know what? Why don't we put our light hose and get a lighter valve and put it into our clip? And sure enough, it was like a win-win, almost like divine intervention, should I say. Like, how could we have been so lucky that we already had the hose, we already had arms, and now we just had to put it in place. Um, now, because- is that the one on, on your YouTube? You, you have a nice YouTube channel. It's called A Flex Assist Arm that I'm subscribed to. Um, there's a video called Initial Delivery and Attachment. Uh, yeah. Initial Delivery and Attachment of what? Is that the uh, LVE there- or the HVE? Yeah, there's there's several different ones. We have a clamp system, which is is this one that goes on the neck of a chair, which is what you're seeing here. I don't know if you can see it. And then we have one that's a pump system that goes just on the back if of the chair. you're listening to this on iTunes, and uh, thank you for uh, the, I think we just passed 8 million downloads, but you might want to switch over to YouTube um, so you can see that video. So just go to uh, youtube.com forward slash Dentaltown Magazine. Uh, but she's given the, uh, the demo right there on the video. That'd probably be better. Um, yep, but uh, um, 
So we now I worked with the I'm back in California times and I lived there. I worked for an, a holistic dental a dental office and and he had a dent air vac machine. And we were using that many, 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 many years ago. And for amalgam removal, big, you know, the, the mercury vapors. And so I thought, why couldn't the suction at least suck, suck up the aerosol into a funnel right there at the source? And so that's when the funnel system um, came about. And um, gosh, you make me think of so many things. Number one, um, going back to the early pandemic when they were looking at aerosols, who were the people already ready for it? It was the... Uh, the mercury removal people who right. like um, all the high speed evacuation equipment, all that stuff. And the people that were supplying them, um, my gosh, it, they, they never knew that the, the two decades of Hal Huggins and all that were everybody just thought on dental town. It's just kind of a fringe element. And it, and it was always will be a fringe element um, because it didn't pass the truth and lending deal. I mean, um, they would, um, you know, they would, they would all be talking about how mercury is so bad for you. And it's like, okay, you know, you're listening to that while you're eating, you know, Pringles out of a can and drinking a shot of vodka. And, you know, I mean, we, we, I, I get it. But then it would go from, oh, you have eight MOD amalgams. To, you need a thirty thousand dollar train plan. I'm like, whoa, 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 Spanky, slow the hell down. It was just, it was just always that the, the people that were the leaders. Yeah. It was always, you know, they would build the case, but you knew where the story was going to end. It was going to be a thirty thousand dollar full mount train plan, and that's why nobody trusted these guys. If they, you know, I mean, if you came to me and you had eight MOD composite amalgams and said, "Can you replace them with composite?" I mean, what eight times two fifty? I mean, the most I'm thinking is two grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't even know how to hallucinate to get to a twenty-five thousand dollars treatment plan, but they always did. So you know, remember well, action speak for everybody. Louder. What's that? Full mouth reconstruction for everybody. Yeah. So you know, if you're combining your altruistic, uh, holier than thou, where you know something that the two million dentists don't, and all blah 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 blah, you may be right. But when you turn around to your patient, and it's an elderly lady suffering from MS, and it's always going to be a twenty-five thousand dollars treatment plan. You look like a charlatan. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you're not, you're not, you're not winning friends and influencing people. You're just, you're just, you know, just throw them under dust. But, but they were the ones all ready to go. In, in fact, you you just said a comment earlier that aerosols was a thing before COVID. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me, so been. tell me, is that why this is a game changer for you? Because more hygienists are wanting high vacuum, uh, just vacuuming the viruses out of the air and mouth and throwing them outside. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it goes right into your vacuum unit, your system. So it's right into your, your, your treatments. You know, it's a, the aerosols are getting sucked up at the source here, just like a dent air back, but it's not being filtered in these HEPA filters, which we really don't know if they're, those HEPA filters are really working and things like that. This goes right into your sewer system, just like, you know, everything else that you suck up, you know, using your HPE. Um, but yes, aerosol was around before COVID. It just was starting to be a big deal. And that and then this made me nervous because I invented the Aflux Assist Arm Original, which is for the saliva ejector. So a lot of people were like, well, we're going to have to start using HVE now for our aerosol control. This is a thing. And I was like, okay, that might have to, we might have to change up the plan here. But um you know, that's why we had the clip for the, the, the HVE so soon. We already had it. Now, you also had a, a Velcro disc, or was that something totally different? Yes. So, we had um, our original ones were, so this is the, this is an LVE as well. So, we had a blue dial, which was awesome. It just, you know, basically, same, same situation. It sticks on the chair, righty tighty, lefty loosey with the suction. And ADEC chairs specifically weren't, you couldn't attach to them because of the surface. Even though it looks slick and beautiful, it just was like, not no bueno, wasn't happening. So we had these discs that we would put on the chair and then we would attach the, the A-flex to the disc. Okay, so how did you attach the disc to the chair? Did you glue it on or how'd you do that? They were, they were adhesives. And when we got the big guy, the big dog here, we had to get a bigger disc and we had to go with 3M and we had to like work with them on glues and then come to find out, Howard, that those discs were not staying to the ADEC chairs. And when we were in back order and we send all these things out, 
a lot of them were falling off the chair. So we went back to the drawing board immediately and came up with these two amazing systems and replaced all of those ones that were falling off the chair for our customers. Now, I'm just curious when it didn't, uh, you said it didn't, um, it wouldn't work on an A deck chair. And yeah, so, a few um, other ones too, like some, some certain yeah. royals. But I was just curious, that. did you, did you tell that to, um, Ken and Joanne, um, um, Austin, the founders of ADEC? No, I don't even know who they are. We tried reaching out to ADEC personally and we're like, what kind of chair do you have? What is the material? I mean, we, we really did try, but there was like, it was like getting nowhere. Just like, you know, and how, how long, how long ago was that? Uh, that was in February, March, February. April, probably of in what, April. Of what year? This year, right? Yeah. During and COVID. say he died um, May 2nd, 2019. Oh. And so here's a lesson for you stock kids out there. So when the founding father builds a company, I mean, he just, this is all he wants to do. And then you give it to the grandkids, uh, the children and the grandkids, and all the research tell you by the time it gets to the third generation, there, there won't be a company. Um, yeah. And Because you can expect, it's like my dad, he was devastated that I didn't want to follow him into Sonic Drive-In. And, you know, he's, he just couldn't understand it. And I'm like, well, Dad, you make hamburgers and French fries. I mean, really? You don't think there's... And my other and next door neighbor was a dentist, Kenny Anderson. And he had an x-ray looking through teeth, doing root canals and all this stuff like that. And um, so all these um, all these companies, these founding fathers, same thing with the, uh, with the stock. When the founding father of the stock dies, um, you better hold on to your horses because... That founding father is not going to be um, the, the the person that replaced them. And then another thing, um, when that person leads it to the a crash in the ground and he gets refinanced, he comes out of Chapter 7, he gets reorganized, and it's the same idiot that drove it into the wall is now given the keys again. Yeah. Well, he's going to drive it into the wall even faster next time. So um, you always that's why they always say start with the top, work your way down. But, yeah, um, Ken died a year ago, but... It, nicest guy in the world and um when we um um when we'd ever go on vacations i would always uh stop at any dental company that would give a tour to my four boys when they were little and uh ken and joanne austin um his his um when he wasn't doing that he was restoring cars and oh, he literally cool. had a restored car collection that would uh i mean you know i mean I mean, I, I can't think of a bigger selection museum I've ever seen. Uh, but by God, that guy was a hundred percent engineer. If you would have showed that to Ken, he would have he would have, he would have uh, helped you. I, I know he would have. He would have. And and ADEC, that's in they're in Washington, right? In, in their companies in Washington, right? Uh, Oregon, uh, just Oregon. south of Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Town. Oregon. Oregon's great. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that ADEC should like, you know, buy, we should like be a one in one, like buy a chair, you get an A-flex arm. <laughs> and, and do you think that is going to be, I mean, again, what is the most weighted reason for buying this arm? Is it ergonomics? Is it aerosols? What would be the most weighted uh, versus, you know, and, and work your way down? Okay. So there's two different ways you can look at it. For sure, with the HP system, it's going to be aerosol. And this is going to keep you from when you're using your, your, you know, let's just say uh, ultrasonic instrumentation as a hygienist, when you're anterior, where is it coming out mostly right in, the, right in the anterior posterior, great anterior aerosols coming out. So this is designed to collect that aerosol. You could use any modality you want. If you're used to using a saliva ejector and hanging it off the side of the patient's face, then, then you could still use this apparatus. And now you haven't changed your whole world. Or you could do use the Aflex original and this, and now you have freed up both hands, the saliva ejector suspended, and you can use your indirect vision and you can work ergonomically. So there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. If you're using a um, you know, an HVE following around with your aerosol and you, you know, you don't, you, you don't get it. And then you have this there. Now you have double protection that you're going to get that aerosol. So honestly, you can't go wrong with either or ergonomics, you know, they're both, it's two in one, like even with the hose, like you could buy just this hose and save hundreds of dollars if you're a dentist because it's light and if you don't want to buy one of those pure back systems that you have to constantly spend lots of money on this hose you just follow around like that and it's a it's a no-brainer so 
Either or, both of them are aerosol control and ergonomics. So and it let's, let's how go, you practice. Yeah, let's go back. Um, my gosh, um, when was um when was uh David Acker? Um, oh. so that that was the um the, the first pandemic. Yeah, yeah, here, here it is, right here, under AIDS on downtown in September of eighty nine. Uh-huh. So can, I know you're a girl, but can I ask how old you were in eighty nine? Were you a high, when when did you become a hygienist? Uh, two thousand sixteen. I was forty. I'm forty six right now. So. <laughs> So when did you get out of school? I got out of school at 2016 at 40. Oh my God. I uh, know. Uh, so well, how old were you in 89? 1989. Uh, I was born in 74. So I was probably what? 10, 15. 11. So, yeah. so yeah. Do you, I mean, you're a hygienist, but do you remember the David Acker story about the, uh, the blonde Kimberly Bergalis who caught AIDS at the dental office? No, I mean, I, I, no, I don't remember the story. So it was an interesting story. In 1989, college student Kimberly Ann Bergalis was diagnosed with AIDS, no identified HIV risk factors, except patient had dental extractions 24 months earlier by dentist David Acker, who was diagnosed with AIDS three months prior to treating Kim. Blood samples were obtained from the patient. There was a high degree of genetic similarity between the HIV. But anyway, this was the first virus rodeo that a lot of us lived through. And then where I was going with that is um, um, back in that time, those dentists in Wichita, it's so funny how now with getting them to wear a mask, it was like that even worse, trying to get them to wear gloves. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I could name names of dentists in uh, Wichita uh, that got their 12 gauge shotgun out from behind their desk and told me, yeah, you, the whoever comes in here and tells me I got to wear gloves, blah, blah, you know, and cause humans are just nuts. And, um, but but it raised our game. I mean, we started wearing gloves. We started wearing masks. We we changed a lot of things. And after the AIDS epidemic wasn't a scare deal anymore and everybody understood it, the pandemic went on to kill 36 million people. But all those infection control things that we implemented never went away and made it so much stronger for this second pandemic that um, I'm working through now, um, this coronavirus. What changes have you seen from the pandemic for aerosols and because hygienists, um, we keep hearing a lot of things. Um, some of them are um, very um, against aerosols. Some some don't want to work in their office because the the hygienist in the room next door is using an aerosol. What do you? What changes have you seen? But more importantly, what changes do you think that when the pandemic's over, like five years from now, when everybody's forgot about it or ten, that dentistry will still be doing? 10, 20, 30 years from now, as opposed to what they're doing in the crazy days during the pandemic? Okay, great question. Uh, changes. First of all, the hygienist in general, and I hate to say this because I'm one of them, is a creature of habit. We don't like change. Okay. So the fact that I've seen positive that they're all starting to, to get change and they're all starting to look at things like an arm or something different that's going to keep them safe. So they're they're very concerned about the aerosols. Um, things that I've seen, products like mine, the you know the the big the big sections now are important. There is a buzz on aerosol changes. What I'm afraid of is that if COVID goes, you know, goes dormant or whatever, then they're just not they're going to be complacent. But they shouldn't be because aerosols there. I mean, there's going to be another. I mean, let's just say a flu. I mean, you're still going to have an aerosol issue, period, and a discussion. Um, those are positive changes that I see people going outside their, their box and their comfort zone to get different products. And hygienists are inventing different products because of those reasons. So um, face shields, better protection, um, better cleaning. But then I've also seen people not using the aerosols and they're just doing hand scaling, which I think is not an efficient way to practice. So, so you, you, you think, um, um, air, uh, ultrasonics are here to stay. I uh, hope they're, they're, they're not going to go away because of uh, the, the pandemic and aerosols. Do you, you, I, 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 I would hope not. I mean, I really think that they're an amazing, you know, instrumentation for us, but no, I don't think so. That would be like saying the, the hand pieces are going to go away because of the aerosol. Maybe right. they will. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's not, it's not going to happen, is it? Uh, so, no. so um, in Florida, you know, you're on the ground. Um, have you, what percent of hygienists um, do you think have just, um, due to the aerosols and all that, just removed themselves from the workplace and said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this, and they're out, out, out of work? 
do you think and the media is always trying to you know you never know what the media is doing but the the weird the weird thing about the media is they can take one event that really happened like uh say um they say you walked out of the phoenix airport and hit me over the head with an aflex arm you know and it was filmed well they could they, they could make everybody think that hygienists all around the world are attacking and killing people with with aflex <laughs> arms but um um what what are you seeing in florida um what percent of the hygienists would you say uh think this is Media hype, overblown, crazy. How many of them are really scared, and how many of them are, are take it really serious? And how many of them have? Um, do you think remove themselves from the workplace? That's a good question. I don't really have the answer to that. I wish I did. Um, I, I can't honestly say that. I, I don't know the percentage, you know, of of, of hygienists that decided okay, to. Okay, so to then get let's go to the other side. The patient of the patients of Florida. What percent of them? Is dentistry business as usual? They don't care about it. Like, like my, my four boys, they're mm-hmm. 30, 28, 26, 24. They would laugh if you, I mean, they, they, they just think, they just see it killing old people. And they're like, you're like, Dad, I understand why you're scared. I mean, you're, you know, you're an old guy, but I yeah. mean, they're, they're, they're that time of life where they're fearless. Um, yeah. What percent of the patients in Florida are like that right now? Um, I don't think enough are aware, honestly. I think that I think that in dentistry as a whole, I don't think the public is is understanding what goes on at a dental office, even from the beginning, and what st- type of things we're implementing um, as a as an industry. I don't think they're aware. I think that when they go to the dental office, if they hear something on the on the on the like TV, do you have something for the aerosol? They'll say yes, we use an HBE. We have that. And that's true, right? This collects aerosol if you're following around with it. So what's so there there's there's a way to get away from from purchasing a device that's like an extra oral unit, not just mine, just any extra oral unit or HEPA filters or things like that. Um, I would say that probably 80 percent. No, I would say 75 percent. No more about air filtration throughout the for, throughout the offices versus at the source aerosol containment. That's my guess. That's a guess. Um, and, and as far as where are the offices from um, pre-pandemic to now, as far as busyness, are, and you're in a, where you're out in Florida, um, are they back to where they were pre-pandemic or yeah. where, where that? Yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of places here that are already full fledged. I mean, we're in Florida. I mean, we already have the bars open here. I mean, I think there are in Arizona as well. So, I mean, it is, it's, and we have a huge, I live in Broward County, which is a huge epicenter for COVID. Like it's, it's pretty high up there. Um, and that's because we have, so, you know, the regulations have been limited, you know, not limited actually. Like, So oh. are you, are you, um, and your family, are you pretty say, social distancing or are you more yeah. uh, fearless? We do- we do a lot of social distancing because we have um, we have our our family members coming working for us. Like they work, they help us here. This is our building, so they come in and they're older. You know, our um, Gary's parents. You know, they they help us pack up stuff and build arms and do lots of stuff. So we have to be real careful. Wow. So so how do you think COVID has changed uh, hygiene um, as of now? How, how do you think it's um. Do well, you think it's too early to tell only halfway through the pandemic? I mean, we're, we're in November now, so it was, um, it was found in March. So we've already lived seven months through it. Sounds like everybody's saying it's a 22, 24-month thing. How do, how do you think it's a changed hygiene right now? Well, I think that there's a lot of people right now that are still only doing hand scaling. I mean, I've had several of my own friends say, oh, you know, my dad went to the dentist and they're, they don't use the, the, the water thing. They call it the water thing, right? The ultrasonic, they only use the hand scaling. So there are a lot of offices that I am, I'm aware of throughout the nation that are just doing hand scaling and hygienists when I have sold the product and they've talked to my customer service people, they're like so excited that they can go back to using their ultrasonic because it makes their lives harder. Oh yeah. That would just be horrible if you took away uh, that stuff. I mean, and, and the quality of the cleaning. I mean, if you think the cleaning is the same quality with that, I mean, it's just, uh, that's no way. Um, yeah. God, I remember when we used to all do uh, um, hand filing, and the first, you really wanted to clean that root canal well. And so I had a blister on my index finger and my thumb for five years of just doing that all the time. And then when it came out with Nitai, 
I mean, not, not only was it 10 times faster, but you could never have filed out the volume and you just couldn't have done it that good. So yeah. uh, it's going to, uh, it's going to be uh, sad if it doesn't go. Um, so, um, so is it mostly being sold um, to hygienists or is it also being sold to dental assistants when they're in the room uh, working alone? Okay. So most of the purchases come from doctors. And that's because they want to keep their hygienist safe and give them something that they feel comfortable with. Um, so I think that at the beginning, a lot of doctors during the, during the rush of like, my office is closed. I don't know what I'm going to get. I got to spend all this thousands of dollars, you know, to get back on into business and all the, all the stuff that every practice went through. Um, they used, they bought different, different types of products to help their hygienists feel comfortable going back to work. And I think that some of them are still looking for something out there and, you know, we still get our sales coming in, but that is pretty much, you know, where most of our sales is coming from. A lot of hygienists don't buy them on their own, I have to say. Um, maybe it's a cost thing. Maybe it's just, you know, they're waiting for their office to buy it. So, I so mean, how I'm, many, how many hygiene, uh, how many dental offices have you worked at in your lifetime? Good question. Um, let's see, starting with my uncle and then Dr. Moreno, uh, Dr. Wynn, one, two, three four, five, five. And, and that's very interesting because, um, I think that, um, you know, the, the dentist listening to you right now, they've only worked in their dental office last five, 10, 20, 30 years. They don't realize that when the, um, the Benco rep comes in once a week, yeah. that she's seeing, you know, 20, 30 other offices and it's the humble guy that can make her feel safe to sit there and say, you know, I, I've seen this system work a lot better in other places. You know, once you put on a humility face and everybody will, uh, once you, that you, you let everybody know you, you want to do better. You want to learn. How can, how can I be better? Then your, then your reps start helping you, uh, your yeah. employees from the uh, last office. My, my, I turned my worst day, which is when they give you a, you know, a temp. Oh my God. Oh my God. I hate that. I mean, you know, you've had the same assistant 20, 30 years and then you yeah. walk in there and it's some girl you couldn't pick out of a police lineup. It's just horrible. And yeah. my staff knows I, I hate it, but I, I spin it around as a positive by telling this complete stranger uh, that um, I ask her like, well, how long have you been assistant? How many offices have you worked in this and that? And then you realize, okay, you've been in 20, 30 offices routinely. Yeah. Well, then, then I say, well, obviously you can find, I want you to find the top three worst things I do that you've seen better somewhere else oh, and wow, empower them. And, yeah. um, and cause, cause people like you get to see all these offices. So yeah. what do you, what do you think, um, doc who never left his own office? What do you, what do you think doc doesn't know that other dentists are doing, uh, that would make him uh, do everything faster, better, easier, cheaper, all that stuff. Huh? Good question. Um, what doc doesn't know. Well, I think that, you know, there's, there's so many different things out there. I mean, you got, well, obviously digital x-rays, you got, you got, you know, implementation for, you know, root canal systems that are faster. If he's a general dentist, uh, you got, you know, an extra oral unit that, that you could hook up to your own system. That's affordable. Like my product, um, you, you have, you know, there's different types of, um, things that, you know, software programs out there for dental, dental, you know, hygienists, uh, that are efficient and, and make life a lot easier. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there's just so many things out there. I well, mean, one, depends. one, one, um, where hygienists remind me a lot is teachers yeah. um, to where um, I'm, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. I'm going to do my best to just really piss you off right now, but I know you're in Florida. It'll take you three days to get here. all plenty of time to hide, but you know, the hygienists, have, you know, let, let's go back 30 years. You know, they, they need an hour. And yeah. so they'd start saying, well, you know, if we went from uh, hand dipping these x-rays to buying this real expensive eight, three, 2000 developer, uh, it'll save us all this time. Okay. But the cleaning was still an hour. Um, they said, they said digital x-rays. Okay. The cleaning still an hour. I mean, it's like, it's like no matter what you invest into the room, it's still an hour. And then you walk up to your hygienist and say, okay, your next patient, she has an upper denture, lower partial. She only has two teeth. 
how much time do you need? An hour. And it's like, <laughs> my God. Um, so one of the things, the same thing with teachers, they, um, uh, they, they always act, they always want more money, more money, more money, more money, more money. And then at the end of the day, um, they, they, they saw the same class size. In fact, it's kind of crazy with, um, you already saw the working from home before the pandemic where, you know, like you take our office. I mean, we have 50 people, five of them never come in. And, and so when we were moving more to home, we already had those systems in place. And so Free Enterprise was already learning how to work through home all the way from the last Y2K bubble pop. And it was nothing to ramp up, um, you know, the, the 20% that work from home up to lots higher numbers. But look at the schools, though. Um, you know, they always complain about class size. You've been doing it through Zoom. I got a couple grandkids living with me to do this, so... Um, you know, it's, uh, for help. And the bottom line is they, when they want to back up, they want to go full blown. It's like, well, why don't you just have half the kids come in Monday and Wednesday and half yeah. come in Tuesday and Thursday? Why don't you think outside the box and yeah. trying to shove the genie back into that bottle that it, it never was about education or anything. It was just about, they want them in their building Monday through Friday, you know, that they just can't think. And, um, I, I'm just looking at all this stuff saying, you know, what is this pandemic going to do where the genie's not going to go in the box? Like, I think Airbnb is going to replace all these billion dollar resort properties. Oh, wow. Uh, because, uh, you know, so whatever the total value of all these resort properties is going to be, is going to yeah. be transferred to Airbnb. And I've already seen that exploding everywhere with Airbnb properties because now people are realizing that I don't want to go stay in a nice resort. I want to go rent a home where it's just my infected yeah. family and nobody else's infected family uh, unless, but, you live, unless you live where i live where it's all high rises you know <laughs> yeah so so what do you so being in five um different dental offices and um and some doctors don't have listening skills better than others what do you think dentists do the most where their hygienists love to work for them stay on time live happily ever after and what or the dentist doing that's just so annoying. And I want to remind dentists that, you know, they, this figured out a study just a couple of years ago in medical malpractice, some, some statistician actuarian realized, oh my God, it's the same people getting all the claims. And they realized that like 3% of the people they insure have like 80% of the claims. And they figured out it's just because they, they, they're, they're, they're assholes. I mean, yeah. people would be get upset and then they'd make it worse. And other people had empathy, listening, made it better. But um, I, I'm sure all my homies want to be a great boss. They want to be a great leader. What do you think they uh, do right and wrong when they're trying to manage a hygienist? Well, I think that, um, okay, that's a good question. I will, let's go back to the time, the time thing. Uh, hygienists are educators, number one. I mean, that's what we should be doing. And they should be you know, basically putting the hygienist into that position of, of trust that there is going to, that they're going to guide that patient to ultimate treatment. Um, I think that there is a lot of, um, I think, you know, I've gone through several different um, management systems. I've gone through Blatchford Solutions. So you got to remember, these are all like, you know, I've gone through Sally McKenzie, who she passed away. Um, and I've also gone through uh, Kathy Jamison's training. So to me, I've been very, very, very spoiled. Okay. And I, that I'm a, I, I've been very fortunate that I haven't worked at like a, a puppy mill type dentistry place where they're just get them in, get them out. And let's just, you know, piecemeal these things together. Um, I've been educated from a, from a different standpoint in dentistry. And I think that's what most dentists need to do is think comprehensively and then train their dental hygienists and their dental assistants to think like that as well. So in that leadership, I think there's a lot of different um, things that you could do. I think you could do clipped and strength finders, um, you know, learning about people's personalities, going through disc, disc training with your, with your um, companies or your, your employees to figure out how to relate to the patient on a different level, because it's all about um, patient relationship and the hygienist and the doctor relationship. And I think that's where there's a, a, a skill lack there. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> and, and, one of the, and it reminds me of the Westinghouse study. When I hear a lot of this stuff, I always go right back to the Westinghouse study. WM Deming talk about they the first thing they noticed and some guy said these, these people don't have enough money uh, don't have enough light to see so he invested a bunch of money so to increase lighting and the productivity increased 
Right. And of course, but the but the real scientists said, okay, well, a you don't have a control, and if it worked going up, well, where's the control? You know, make it darker. So yeah. they they set up a different deal, and they went to a different factory, and they actually made the deal light um, darker, and that increased the productivity. And they're like, what the hell? Lighter, darker? And what they figured out when it was all over is that when the workers saw that management actually cared and was trying to help them by do you guys need more light? Is it too light? Just yep. showing that you cared, everybody's productivity increased. And okay. some some um, people do that really well, and some people don't do that um, at all. But just just showing that you uh, care and have concern uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, what other uh, lessons would you say? <laughs> oh, uh, definitely. Um, like you, yeah, that's a great one. Caring lessons. Um, you know, going to a lot of, you know, I've never went to dental school, but I've worked for some pretty amazing aesthetic dentists, um, people that have gone through lots of different training. Um, oh, please and- don't say it's Jill Wade. Is this another Jill <laughs> Wade rant of how perfect Jill Wade is? <laughs> she did go through that, but my uncle and- also did. At a very young age, I was I was taught um, a lot of things that he already had done some fellowships in. So uh, I think that Getting continuing an education and being excited about dentistry and going and th- and learning more about occlusion and things like that. I think that's very important. Very important because yeah. you can really jack someone's mouth up if you don't know anything about occlusion. And, and so, so there's another <laughs> great takeaway. So, um, everybody in the lecture circuit, especially in the price plan circuit, they all learn this right away that when you go uh, give a lecture. Uh, the right half of the room, each aisle is an office. You know, sometimes they're two, three aisles deep. And then the left side is all the dentists that came by themselves because they're saving money. And if you collected their their 401k or you collected their uh, uh, W or whatever, their IRS deal, th- th- this group's all making 250 plus and this group's all making 175 or less. And yeah. they're doing it saving money. And they realize you have to realize that dentistry is a team effort and taking your uh, class. I mean, who's going to answer all the who answers most of the questions about dentistry? It's not uh, even the dentist or the hygienist. Yeah, The dental assistant. Yeah. The dental yeah. hygienist, the front team. Yeah. And, and so many of them say, well, I'm going to save money and not take any of those people on. Um, what about, um, um, what do you think um, the average hygienist spends waiting for a hygiene exam? Ooh. Oof. Um, five, 10 minutes. Okay. So five to 10 minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but that's an incredibly long time. Uh, what, what do you think of that? Um, I think that that's not good, but I mean, what are you going to do if you, you gotta, you gotta make sure that that dentist, you know, is, it's, it's all about the scheduling. I mean, that's just been a time old, like problem constantly. And, and, and especially if you have two doctors and you have four hygienists and they're doing treatment, you know, you gotta just constantly pop in there, um, but yeah, I mean, it's that's always been an issue. I don't know how to solve that problem, to be honest with you. Well, We've n- number number one, w- one thing that I see, and I, I see it a lot of times, and um, you know, you'll do that where you're you're in the office, you're talking to him, maybe you guys are going to lunch or something, and a hygienist will come and ask for uh, a um, a uh, an exam, and then uh, she'll turn around and then they'll say, "Oh, by the way, I want to show you something." It's like, dude, customers comes first. You you just started a new thing, your project. After yeah. the exam, and it's just um, it's just it just takes discipline, um, and and what oh. where I did at my office is um, um, the assistant knows the best of when you can break. The assistant yeah. knows when she can take over. Uh, the you assistant wear headsets. You know, Do you guys wear headsets? We did for twenty years, but it's it's kind of interesting where you know you have people uh, retire, move. <clears throat> I just lost an assistant for twenty years um, to Houston. And her husband got transferred. I told her, I said, I swear to God, I'll pay for the divorce. I'll put you up in a home. Uh, you know, uh, there's an apartment complex right across the street. And she's like, no, I want to be with my husband. Because it's just so horrible when you're used to someone for a couple of decades. And um, so, but um, I noticed when you, uh, when you have change of people, yeah. you, have, you know, there's change of systems. And, um, you know, and uh, we yeah. used to all love that. And now it, it was a big thing for a couple decades. And now it's no longer a longer thing. How, where, where are you sitting at right now? Okay, so 
No, I think the number one rule, and I and I I know this from experience from very, from a long time ago with my uncle's business. Okay, I was very young. I was really green back then. You know, I'm a young twenty year old person, and and just learning that whenever he would hire someone new, a system would change. But you cannot do that. You have to have systems in place, and you have to be the oak, and you have to follow those systems systematically. And the person comes in learning the systems and develops the culture. You have to have culture at your practice and you have to have a mission statement and you have to stand by what you believe in and keep a culture. You have to have a culture. You have to have a culture in your practice. Yeah. I think, and I think that's strong. So, and, so, the, so I want to know this, uh, you know, to me, the, the biggest issue in dentistry is the hygiene capacity where, you know, where, you know, I talk about this all the time where if you, um, um, if a hygienist works 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, she works 2,000 hours. So, you know, forget perio and, and kids and all that stuff. 2,000 hours means that she could see 1,000 people for an hour cleaning twice a year. Well, if you get 20 new patients a month, you'd be at a hygienist every four years. And if you get 30 new patients a month every two years, and every dentist you walk in, they've had that same hygienist in room one for the last decade and they keep and they and they get thirty new patients a month. So you just mathematically know that if you have a, a cup of coffee and you pour coffee into it, as soon as it's full, all the coffee you pour into it, all other coffee's coming over the top. So for thirty years they practice where every time someone comes in new, someone else leaves. And um, I have always associated the number one cause of employee of a uh, patient turnover is employee turnover. And I'm in here ground zero, and I just keep telling all the DSOs every time I podcast their, their um, <clears throat> CEOs that I, I, I've lived here at ground zero. And the number one complaint, they don't say the facility, they don't say the hours, they don't say anything. They go, well, God dang, every time I go in there, it's a different dentist, and I finally got one I liked, and then now she's gone. And it's just, it's just, they, they just, they hate, like, like you said, how hygienists uh, are creatures of, um, they don't like change. Yeah. Well, changing, uh, you know, your cereal from, you know, Cocoa Puffs to Pebble Puffs. I mean, that's not the deal. It's the relationship thing. That's a big deal. And then yeah. I, and then I look at why did they have the employee turnover? Cause a lot of these DSS guys say, well, God, we offer them all this and that and that and that. And it's the same thing I just bitched about. You don't keep the assistant. And I'm straight out of school, and I'm already scared to crap about this molar root canal. I only did three in school, and they were all on typodons. And then I finally go in there on the big day, and my assistant, who you know I've been working with for three months, and we're finally working together, and she's gone. It's like, what the hell? I mean, yeah. they, they just want to go where some place is stable. I, I think they'd rather live in a trailer home if it was a stable family. They yeah. live in a mansion. If it yeah. was, you know, if uh, you know, some uh, Eddie Murphy ran it, and it was cr crazy place, right? I mean, you know. So, um, why do you think hygienists turn over then? Why Why do you think they quit places they love? Is it just logistics, like you moved from California to Dallas to Florida, or um, wh why do you think they quit? I think that it's time um, and disrespect. Like, you know, they're either, either there's no communication with the dentist um, and the pressure of selling something. Oh, there's pressure of like, oh, you got to make these numbers. I think that's, a, that's huge. Um, and does that come from individual dentists or is that um, from a management, like, like a, um, an aggressive office manager? Is there, is it actually a clinical dentist in there trying to get you to make your numbers on selling dentistry? <laughs> I think that there's a lot of pressure on hy hygienists with making numbers for sure. But I don't know if that's, and again, it's, again, I've been spoiled. I've been worked. I've been great. I, I've had worked in great places. So it's hard for me to complain when I haven't really experienced that pressure of a turn and burn feeling where hurry up, get them in, get them in. And that maybe they lack the connection with the patient. And so then they're a bit burnt out because they're really not doing what they thought they were going to do in school, which was helping people. They're now Why? they're just got to go. We got to get this cleaning done. I got to make this money. And they're really not doing that education that really sparks a sparks a hygienist. I, I believe educating that patient is something that 
all hygienists love to do. And they want that time and they want to be able to do it right. And they want that training and they want to take pride in what they do, but they're getting burnt out because it's just, they don't have the time. And then they're cutting corners and they don't want to cut corners. I think it's a whole circle of problems. In that, and, in, in and what's that. really interesting is I'm um, desperate people do different desperate things. So if you've got a doc and he's overspending on the house, the car, the Rolex watch, he's got the trophy wife that stays home and eats bomb bombs and destroys 10,000 a month and all that stuff. Then he's in a truly desperate situation. He's doing all this. But the dentists that live below their means, they're trying to muscle all this crazy stuff, but they, they work on the people time money. They work on the people. They slow down the, the staff turnover. Uh, they do new new office tours, new patient exams. Like when people say, um, can you do uh, first appointment cleanings? Well, I, I want a first appointment relationship. I mean, when that came in here, um, is someone going to give them a tour of the office? Is, um, are you going to meet the dentist? You know, if, if we see eye to eye and smile and we all feel warm and fuzzy, I don't care if we have a first appointment as a root canal or your wisdom teeth or a cleaning. I'm not into that. But if you figure out all that people stuff, then they stay with you. You don't have the employee turnover. You don't have the staff turnover. I mean, look at Hoover Dam. You just barely build a dam on a river. And you can't even see across that river. I mean, it's just huge. Patient retention is everything. And, um, you know, if you can figure out patient retention, you don't have to do desperate things. The problem will be when can we get Megan in to get that done because we're booked, not, oh, well, you know, can you try to convert that MOD into a crown or can you try to, you know, instead of sell, 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 it turns into operations and logistics let's just be good logistics let's be good operators because we already got the brand and the brand is the the dental industry starts when a human being walks up to a dentist and hands them a coin to fix their tooth Mm -hmm. and that has expanded to two million dentistry and eight billion people and it's that doctor um patient relationship which i can see why walgreens could automate into a dso and and take all the pharmacists to employees and all that stuff. I just don't know how you're going to do that in dentistry when they're, you're, you're, you got to touch them. It's all surgery. You're leaning back. They got to trust you. I mean, it's so easy for something to go wrong. Um, uh, a new assistant, a new dentist, and they're, they're done and they're changing offices. Um, you know, um, and size matters too. Size really, really matters. And I know when I say the smaller, the better, you're going to say, well, of course you would say that. Uh, but, you know, uh, and the deal is, um, I, I go back to the Kaiser Permanente deals. That, that blew my mind when I went out there in Oregon and, and spent the day with a director um, after he had set up nine offices. He wanted to pick my brain. I wanted to pick his brain. It was a mutual love affair. But the first one was like a normal office, like five. Uh, operatories. But the next one, you know, you're getting bigger. It went to seven and went to nine. By the time they hit the 30 chairs, they had to have a complaint department. And he told me and he showed me the math that, you know, for his walnut brain, eight to 10 was the cutoff. Because once it got bigger than eight to 10, people didn't even think they were at a personal dental's office. They thought they were at a dental clinic. And he sure. said in Oregon, now it's a different culture. They may call it some different in Canada or Texas, but but once all the once they passed uh, eight to ten chairs, everyone referred to it as a clinic. They lowered their expectations of quality. They were more easily to you know get upset with you. And so if you could, so I I think the counter to DSOs is keep a small dental office with a bunch of employees that stay there till they're so old, you have to take them out behind the office and actually put them down, you know, and uh, because the vet won't do it. And, uh, you know, because it's illegal and uh, all that stuff. But it it just go back to the basics. Um, You want to go to a bar where everybody knows your name. You want to get your teeth cleaned by the hygienist who knows you. And and then I want to touch on that for a minute because the problem we've had with the keeping the same hygienist is if one uses an ultrasonic, and the other one uses um, that, um, what is that, um, rocket blasting powder machine where you oh, walk yeah, out of yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. even even when you go home that night and take your socks off, you still find that baking soda in your socks. Like, how the hell did you get it in my sock? But the thing is, <clears throat> the funniest one was when this first started happening, we all had one hygienist. All the patients loved her, but... We all teased her because we thought she was a butcher because whenever her patients rinsed out in the cuspidor back when we have, it's just a bloodbath. And um, she was on a pregnancy leave, and the other hygienists were filling in her patients. Um, we generated a lot of complaints. They get up front, and they go, 
I, 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 didn't, I don't feel like it was a good cleaning. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Why do you think that? You go, well, when I spit in the custard, the, it was barely pink. But my God, when Missy did it, it just be chunks of blood. And we're like, ah, ah. And you think, well, that, that, that's bad, right? Don't you like this person who doesn't make you spit up chunks of blood? And then the hell no, they, they love Missy to death. That's the way she always did it. That's the way they always want it. They don't want, they want everything the same. But if they trust you, you can scale them till they spit out chunks of tissue. Uh, <laughs> but you change that and they get upset. They just, they just don't do well with change. That's very true. That is extremely true. You have to have your, you have to have, that's one of the things as a hygienist, you have to put your ego aside. I think that in general, women can be, you know, catty. And if you, if you all just come together, like we had four hygienists, you know, all, all four of us, we, we had, we all were calibrated the same and we, we never, it wasn't like we're putting you on this schedule. Like this is our schedule. You can only see Aurelia. That's it. Like I would never, ever, I shouldn't say never, ever. Once in a while, I would keep my patients with me, but I would schedule them on Cheryl's or I would schedule them on Holly's or whoever else, just because it's very important to, to mix it up. And that was one of the things that Dr. Wade was like very adamant about because you never know who's going to be leaving. We know Cheryl wasn't going to leave because she's been with Dr. Wade for 20 years, but you know, I might leave Holly's getting pregnant. You know, there's different people that, that are going to be circulating. And if you, you get all of your patients used to the same thing, maybe their cleaning is different, but your intro oral pictures are being taken the same way. You have a system, everyone's following it. You're used to that same system, no matter what. It's just now just getting your teeth cleaned. And I want to say something else about uh, Jill Wade. Uh, she's a DDS and she has her MAGD. And, and yep. one of the yep. reasons I do this podcast is because um, when I was, you know, in Phoenix, you know, it's a 3.8 million metro because it's not just Phoenix, which is a million people, Scottsdale and all these suburbs, Tempe, Mesa, Gilbert, all this stuff like that. And yeah. there's so many study clubs and there's so many opportunities for CE. But the one thing I've noticed is that the dentists who take 100 hours of CE, and I don't care if it's online study clubs, podcasts, don't matter. But that habit, I mean, we all make habits. And some of them are good, some of them are bad. And um, my God, when you get that CE habit, it doesn't matter what they go into. If they go into cosmetics, TMJ, whatever. If they're uh, getting 100 hours of positive information into their head, you, if you throw enough shit on the wall, something's going to stick. And you don't know when they're coming out of school what that's going to stick. You know, they, they might think this, and they might end up here. Some people take one course on implants and swear to God they'll never do it again. And then another guy will take it, and it's 100 hours a year until he dies. Um, you know, um, I hate cosmetic dentistry, but not nearly as bad as pediatric dentistry. I, I just don't want to deal with some... 50 year old woman who's back on the, the marriage scene and she's a fixer upper and uh, she's, she's because all that craziness is going to go into the expectations of your crown. And it's like, you know, I, you need a shrink, not a dentist. Um, I love pain. I love people are in pain. They can't sleep. They've been up all night. I love that. Um, as long as they're not crying and uh, all that kind of stuff um, for the pediatric dentist. But when I see that MAGD, uh, I, I don't care what it means to me, uh, same as a diplomat in International Congress of Pontology, Fellowship, Mission, whatever. Yeah. It just means they got a habit where they liked taking CE. And if you and the way I looked at this podcast is I podcast people all the time that are never going to be in your town in Salina, Kansas. I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing being in Phoenix or New York or Miami, uh, but there, there's people out there, you know, in, a, in the rural area and the downloads in, around the world are, are crazily insane. And if you listen to enough people who love dentistry, you're going to love dentistry. You're going to take away some of their ideas. Uh, it's like a cafeteria. You know, I walk through the cafeteria. I, uh, um, you know, some things you like, some things you don't like. But if that cafeteria buffet line lo is long enough, you're going to find something you like to eat, and it's going to work, and it's going to make you happy. And uh, the main thing about the team uh, that I see with the hygienist and everything, you, you said they were – uh, catty or complicated. I, I grew up with five sisters and, you know, Desmond Morris, all the anthropologists will tell you that women, primates, 
interact more with each other than males. The males usually just the idiots sitting there. Um, when you see any primate villages, the women are running around playing, chasing, feeding, yeah. nursing. They're just far more busy, so that's far more entropy. So if you have twice as many interactions, there's twice as many things that can go wrong. But, but where the dentist needs to be the leader is this. Some people show up every day and they're always the same person and they're always pleasant and they're, they get along. And you have other staff where, I mean, every gosh darn month, there's another drama day. Oh, yeah. And I can work with you for a month and say, Aurelia, you're so nice and you're so smart and I love listening to your, all this stuff and your ergonomics and your environment. I just love you to death. But if one day a month I come in there and said, Aurelia, you, what was that my life um, deal where... Uh, Jane, you ignorant slut. You remember that? Remember that? <laughs> you remember that Saturday Night Live deal? But yeah. you just come in there one day and said, my God, look at the schedule. What idiot, what idiot's in charge of this? And you're like, damn, dog, and me, I've been with you for 10 years. You, you just called me an idiot. And, <laughs> you know, you, you do that, and then the next 30 days of being nice and pretty isn't working. And the dentist, after the root canal, he always goes in his room and shuts the door, and he yeah. doesn't realize that the dental assistant's hiding on top of the break room refrigerator with a knife waiting for the hygienist to walk by and he, she's going to shank him. And it's like, you can't, you're responsible for all this staff turnover because you do not get rid of toxic people. And, um, and if you can't get rid of toxic people because you're a smart dentist who still remembers the Krebs cycle, um, you remember all the good things about her, but that's not how people play and you're not drawing the line um, that there, there's boundaries and, and there's behavior you won't accept. And I'll tell you the funniest thing is when you go see a dental office that no one's been there for two or three years, for like 30 years, oh, I, 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 I already know what it is. One girl's been there the whole time. Yeah. And it's either the, and it's, it, it could be his wife, could be an office manager, but that person just has Doc eating out of the hand because she knows she's got to win someone over. Yeah. And then she's Godzilla on everyone else. And, and that's why you do exit interviews on your patients. That's why, Doc, you need to call your patient and say, Aurelia, um, gosh, you never came back. You came here for two years. Why did you not come back? Uh, did you move? What happened? And they'll tell you why. And then you do that exit interview on your new patients. Um, so it's, it's the first time I've seen you in Phoenix. Did you just move to Phoenix? Where did you move from? Um, if you still lived in your last place, did you lo love going to the dentist there? Why did you like going there? <clears throat> and they're going to tell you their scorecard right there. They're going to go, well, you know, I went to four different dentists in California before I finally found one that had nitrous, Okay. The, there this, you go. <laughs> this, this scorecard and um you know or or it doesn't take the insurance or whatever 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 but after all those things i mean if i don't know how you're thinking um kind of like when they come in with the toothache satisfaction equals perception minus expectation well i'm not going to start explaining to you a root canal build up and crown and how we're going to do all this stuff till i first know what your expectations are so I'll say, well, come on, you you were born um, you were born at night, but not last night. What, what what do you think this tooth needs? And if she says, well, I know we need to pull it and add it to the partial. Damn, I I know where we're starting at. Versus she says, well, I I don't want to lose that tooth. I would die if I lost that tooth. Oh, I, I I just need to know your psychographics. And the dentist is looking at the chart and says, oh, well, you live at 201 North 9th Avenue. And he's going through all the medications and he's going all that stuff. I want to know your psyche. I want to know what um, what did you like the most about any dentist you've ever gone to? What did you like the least about any dentist? What are you expecting to have done today? Um, same, same, same thing with same day, uh, day dentistry. They'll tell you when they want it done today. They'll say, is there any way I can get it done today? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you right now, the only way you're going to get an A on that test is say yes. And if you start thinking about the hygienist schedule or you're entitled to lunch or you want to get out early today, you don't have the hustle and they're going to find another dentist. So uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, thanks for going over an hour. When, when uh, Back to the news today, it's election day. It's uh, the day after the election. Are you hearing anything in Florida when they'll actually finally – factually legally no i don't know yeah i haven't i haven't listened in the last few hours but you know what i was going to say is that's where you have to meet your patient where they're at you have to meet your patient where they're at not where you're at and i think that's a really hard thing to to 
to get across to new dentists and dental wow. hygienists and dental assistants in general. Like you got to meet them where they're at, not where you're at. So that is, them, not about you. That is so well put because a lot of these dentists are delusion because they go to some of these big uh, courses where this master dentist have done all these amazing $25,000 cases, but they're all on dentists. The course is part of the business deal because his practice is all going to be full mouth rehabs because this dentist is convinced that only Dr. Ace could do his TMJ and all this stuff like that. And, yeah. and, and to value dentistry and inclusion and all that to that degree, well, hell yeah, you'd probably be a dentist to do that. Sure. But when Frank comes in... He don't think about all that stuff. So to, yeah. to sit there and go to those courses and they tell you, well, everybody can have that. I remember one time I got just, oh, I almost got punched. I was in a class um, by um, Jim Pride. And he's sitting there saying, you know, I can't, it's like 1987. I got out of school. I got here. I think it was in 1980. He's saying, you know, I see all these people in your patient. They all have crooked teeth and dark teeth. And why can't you convince them to bleach and, and get braces and full mouth rehab? And I, I'm sitting in the front row with my, you know, my two drunk Irish friends and I'm taking out. So I raise my hand and I, and he goes, yeah. And I said, well, um, you're actually a dentist and you have like the darkest, brownest, crookedest teeth I've ever seen in my life. Uh, why did you never do it? Yeah. And I mean, he, he couldn't even breathe for like four minutes. Another one was Walter Haley in, in the that boot camp in Kansas or Texas, Hunt, um, Kansas. Same thing. I was actually, when I took his course, there was a couple of cosmetic gurus or David Hornberg was there. But anyway, like three guys were there. Who all said, dude, I'll do it for free. They're so bad. They're so ugly. You only lecture to dentists and all this motivational stuff. And your teeth look like they could eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence and they're brown. Um, why don't you do that? He, he died with those crooked, ugly teeth. So you, so if you cannot project, the number one worst bias in the world is you project yourself on everyone else. And if you look at cars, they go everywhere from a Ferrari to a moped. You look at houses, it goes everywhere from a mansion to where I live in a van down by the river. And um, so if you think everybody's going to um, value dentistry, uh, they're not. But um, Aurelia Burn RD8, CDA, go to her website, a flex assist arm.com that's a flex a flex f-l-e-x x assistant arm.com thank you so much for coming on the show today hey thank you for having me it's been great <laughs>